you've been reading for the last couple of days about different criteria for living things. And one thing that I want you to understand is that there's some disagreement about some of this. Um, you can look at some biology books and they will have five criteria for living things. Your particular book has six. I've seen other books that have as many as 11 criteria for living things. And so a lot of this depends on how uh, the author of the book is kind of breaking some of these uh, different, different things down. Are they taking some of them and lumping a lot of it together um, to make fewer criteria? Are they splitting them apart and making more of them? Um, so if you ever take another biology class with a different kind of textbook and you see a different number of, uh, of criteria, don't let that surprise you because it's, it's really pretty common. Um, I took the six criteria that she listed in the book. I rearranged them a little bit just because um, I want to try to help you remember kind of a sequence of events um, in, these, in these criteria. The first criteria is that living things are composed of cells. Uh, the cell, as you may already know, is the smallest component of something that is alive. Um, a living thing may be composed of one cell or it may be composed of many cells. Um, you have some bacteria that are composed of just one cell, uh, whereas obviously creatures like you and me were composed of uh, many, many trillions of cells. Um, second um, criteria is that living things contain DNA, and we're going to talk a lot about DNA in some of the upcoming modules. Um, for right now, all you need to understand is that DNA is what gives the instructions to the, um, to the living thing for everything else that follows. Um, it's, it's an instruction book for how the creature functions. And so DNA is, is just that set of instructions that is found in practically every single cell in your body. So DNA gives instructions for, as I said, all four of these remaining things. Um, the first thing is that living things grow and they reproduce. So you can think of this growth and reproduction actually on two levels. You can think of it on the cellular level because in um, cells can grow bigger, cells can divide, and they can make new cells. Um, each time a cell divides, the new uh, creature that or the new being that's formed the new cell that is formed gets DNA from the first cell So those instructions as the cells are growing and reproducing gets passed on to each other cell That's that's being formed. So like your red blood cells because they can grow and they can divide they can make new cells um, when human beings are uh, first formed in the womb. They start with one cell and those cells just keep dividing and dividing and dividing and the instructions in each cell, that DNA in each cell is passed on to each individual, to each additional cell that is formed. So I can think about growth and reproduction on the cellular level and I can also think about it on the organism level. So obviously human beings can reproduce and make more human beings. Rabbits can produce and make more rabbits. Um, maple trees send off those uh, little cute helicopter twirly things and they make more maple trees. And so organisms reproduce themselves. Um, some organisms um, are able to reproduce in an asexual fashion, which means that you only are going to have one parent. And so what that means is that all of the DNA is passed from um, the parent to the child and then the parent and the, we don't necessarily call it a child, but the parent and the offspring are going to be identical to each other because they have the same DNA and they have the, um, the, the same instructions for everything that they're doing. You can also have um, sexual type of reproduction and sexual reproduction means that you're going to have two parents and the offspring are going to be different. So here, your offspring are the same. They're going to be identical to the parent. Um, and then here, you're going to have offspring that are very different from the parents. Obviously, if uh, you look at yourself and you look at your parents, you do not look like they do. But you probably have some characteristics that they have because your DNA came from them. 
Um, we have some um, creatures that we're going to learn that all that they do is they kind of rip themselves in half and pretty soon, voila, they're, they're two, two creatures, whereas they were only one before. So all sorts of interesting things to talk about as far as uh, growth and reproduction, and we will talk a lot about that in the upcoming modules. So uh, the fourth criteria is that living things sense and respond to changes in their surroundings. Um, for example, if you have a change in the chemicals that surround um, a bacteria or a change in the temperature in the ocean water of a fish, if you have changes in air pressure, uh, like if you're going to climb up Mount Everest, some people will get sick from, from the uh, lack of air pressure from elevation. Um, when they get to a higher elevation, that can make them sick. Uh, changes in light um, can cause changes in a creature. And so living things are able to sense those changes and then they are going to respond using the receptors that they have. And why do they need to do that? Because for the next characteristic, living things have to maintain stable internal conditions, which is called homeostasis. Um, the example that your book gives is in temperature. Uh, we are classified as um, endotherms because we have a system inside of us that makes us able to regulate our own temperature. An ectotherm, though, is a creature that does, cannot regulate its own temperature. And so like a snake, a reptile, it has to lay in the sun um, in order to get warm. If it, the temperature gets too hot, then they're going to go hide under a rock so that their body temperature doesn't get too high. Um, so some things they can, if, if you can't regulate it yourself, then you've got to respond to the conditions and move yourself to a place so that you aren't going to die from, from overexposure. So that's just one example um, of homeostasis. Uh, creatures are able to regulate all sorts of things besides their temperature, um, their pH levels, and all sorts of other things in their systems. And again, as we go through biology, we'll continue to talk about more and more of those things. Um, finally, um, in order to maintain those stable internal conditions, uh, you've got to have energy to be able to do that. And so living things are going to extract energy from their surroundings and they're going to convert it into some sort of form that sustains them. Um, that, in one word, is called metabolism. And so you may hear about people having high metabolism or low metabolism. If they have a high metabolism, it's like they, they can eat everything they want and they don't seem to gain any weight. So that's probably the context where you've heard about it before. But all creatures have a metabolism where they're taking in some sort of energy from the surroundings and then they're converting it into a form that powers their activities. Um, there are two pieces to metabolism. Um, the first is catabolism. And catabolism starts out like catastrophe, where if you have a catastrophe, um, like a hurricane, hurricanes tear everything apart. So catabolism is where you have to tear things down in order to then do anabolism, which is putting things back together. So if you think about this in terms of Lego blocks, um, if you the last time you played with, with Legos, I mean, I realize it may have been a while ago, um, but if you take your Lego blocks and you had maybe built an airplane out of them, and then when you put it away, you didn't take anything apart, and then the next time you get the Legos out, you decide maybe you want to build a boat out of them. Well, you're going to have to tear the boat apart to get the pieces, and then you can reconstruct those pieces into, um, into the form of a boat as opposed to how it was before. So catabolism is where you're going to take the food that you eat and you're going to tear it down, break it down into um, proteins and fats and um, all sorts of other types of things that are in that food. And then you're going to rebuild it into uh, bone tissue or muscle tissue or red blood cells or whatever else it is that your body needs. So you're breaking things down in order to rebuild it. And that whole process then is called metabolism. Now we classify organisms, and you did quite a bit of this yesterday already, but I wanna, I wanna go ahead and put it on the board here because I'm gonna add a piece to it that was not in your book. Um, and so if we take organisms and we classify them, we're going to classify them either as autotrophs or as heterotrophs. 
whoops, I spelled that right. Heterotrophs. So auto means self. It's a Greek word that means self. And so what that means is that these um, organisms are able to make their own food. They're either going to use a process called photosynthesis, which you've probably heard of. It's the process that plants use to make their own food from, from sunlight. Or some organisms actually are able to use something called chemosynthesis, where they make their own food using chemical reactions. Um, there aren't a whole lot of those, but, but they, are, um, they do exist. Another word for autotrophs is producers. And you may have heard about that in an earlier science class, but you probably, instead of autotrophs and heterotrophs, you probably heard about producers and consumers. Okay, because they are producing the food, whereas heterotrophs then are going to um, have to get their food from some someplace different than themselves. Hetero actually means different. And so um, there are some consumers, but heterotrophs can also be classified as decomposers. And so decomposers are going to fall in the category of your, your fungi um, and the, the types of creatures that decompose dead material um, so that we're not walking around, um, you know, 16 feet deep in leaves that fall off the trees every year because the decomposers are going to decompose those things and turn them back into uh, the different types of things that we are able to then recreate or not recreate but remake um, other other materials out of them so decomposers are going to break materials down so then your other organisms can take those building blocks and and make new cells uh, more food more whatever out of those things okay so your consumers then as you've already learned about are going to fall into uh, your three categories of um, you're going to have herbivores, and you can have a carnivore, and I'm going to run out of space, and then this is going to be an omnivore. And again, these are probably terms that you had from earlier in your science career. Um, herbivores um, are only going to eat plants. Carnivores are only going to eat other creatures. Um, omnivores are going to be a combination of these. They're going to eat plants and other creatures as well. Okay, so what I want you to be aware of is that we also have a category called decomposers as well as the category called consumers here. Now, um, these uh, six categories, six criteria for living things are very, very important and I want you to be able to remember them and be able to to tell them back to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a way to remember them. Um, sometimes what I do is I will pick key words um, out of um, something that I need to remember and then I'll construct a crazy sentence to help me remember um, the, different, the different components of, of this whole, whole scheme. So the word that, the sentence that I've come up with is this. Crazy dogs growl repeatedly. Growl repeatedly. Um, seen red hot escaping that wrong too. Escaping elephants. So to remember the sentence you're going to put a picture in your head where you have these crazy dogs that are just growling or they're growling and barking and they're upset because what do they see? Remember dogs get upset when they see things that bother them. They're seeing escaping elephants who are bright red and sweating and so the elephants are trying to get away so they can go I don't know maybe plunge into a big uh, pond of water so they can cool off so crazy dogs growl repeatedly seeing red hot escaping elephants okay crazy sentence I know but here's how you use it to remember um, these criteria for living things so crazy starts with the same letter that cells does dogs starts with with the D just like DNA does Growl repeatedly 
starts with the same letters that grow and reproduce do. Seeing red starts with the same letters as sense and respond. Hot starts with the same letter as homeostasis. And then escaping elephant starts with the same letters as extract and convert energy. So here's one E, but you got to put the extract and convert together. Extract and convert energy. Crazy dogs growl repeatedly seeing red hot escaping elephants. Now, you can bet that if I went to all the trouble of making up a sentence to illustrate that and explain it to you, that I'm going to expect you to be able to list the six criteria for living things probably on the test sometime. Okay, so if I give you something like that, take that as a big, huge X marks the spot. You need to know this. Okay, so I'm going to kind of step back out of the way here for just a second so that if you want to pause the video and write down anything that's on the board, you'll be able to see it. Um, make sure that you get the sentence. Maybe you can come up with a better sentence. If you can, email it to me because I'd like to hear it. Um, and then um, you'll be able to remember that, study that, and then you will be able to do well on the test when it finally arrives.